All right, so let's uh, get going with this last session. So this session is about teaching and training epidemiologists really in terms of thinking about what do we need to train the epidemiologists for the future and what skills are we missing. And we've heard a lot of themes already. So, you know, this is a chance to, you know, really sit and think about it. And I know a lot of you have been primed in terms of the breakout session, so let's have some good discussion. And um, anyways, so the first speaker uh, for this panel is uh, Catherine Keyes. Dr. Keyes is at Columbia uh, at the Melbourne School of Public Health, and she is an associate professor. So, Catherine. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation to speak on this uh, really exceptional occasion of the 100 years of epidemiology at this great university where a lot of my mentors have had their training, um, and I've really gotten a lot out of Johns Hopkins Department of Epidemiology, and so it's, it's really great to be able to present this. And I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, um, reflects a lot of the discussion that I heard in the breakout sessions, and so I hope that um, some of my thoughts reflect you know, how, where I stand on uh, what people were talking about today. So I titled my talk today, Does Epidemiology Matter? Because in 2014, with Sandra Galea, I wrote a textbook called Epidemiology Matters. So you'd think that I should probably have an answer to that question. Um, our 2014 textbook was an introduction to teaching epidemiology and in some ways was a departure from how introductory epidemiology is commonly taught, um, but in many ways actually a throwback to how introductory epidemiology used to be taught. The book stemmed from my experience teaching introductory epidemiology for many years at Columbia and the conceptual confusion a lot of my students would have when we tried to teach them methods that were from the predominant textbooks in the field. And I'll give you a sense of those methods here. Um, this is a very fancy pointer. Wait. There we go. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't bring this myself. They gave it to me. So, <laughs> um, so this picture actually summarizes a lot of these textbooks. Um, and it's a heat map of the location of core epidemiological concepts. So the x-axis here um, is uh, a, a core concept in epidemiology, definition, history, cohort study, case control, et cetera. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the y-axis is the concept, and then the x-axis is the relative placement in the textbook where a concept is taught. So as you can imagine, you know, the darker the square, the more density textbooks of epidemiology have. So you know, most textbooks begin with definitions in history at the beginning of the textbooks. Most textbooks end with some sort of discussion of policy applications. And you can see there's some sort of variability, but there's a lot of um, consistency in where textbooks are teach our methods. So they mostly begin with infectious disease, um, though there's some variation in, in where infectious diseases are covered and whether infectious disease concepts are included at all. They move on to basic concepts of frequency and occurrence. Then they move to each epidemiological study design as a distinct sort of chapter. You get your cohort study chapter and your case control chapter. And then you introduce bias and confounding, and you expand with a scattering of other sort of more complicated topics. And one could argue, and, and Alfredo Moravia, I don't know if he's still here, but he has argued to me that he thinks that the reason that these concepts are introduced in this way is that they're similar to the historical development of the field, where first we had to handle infectious diseases and figure out how to measure the occurrence of disease. And then once we got a handle on that, we, could, we had to uh, confront you know, other kinds of more chronic diseases and we had to design studies in order to address them and then had to confront a more complicated array of sources of confounding. <clears throat> but the way we teach epidemiology is um, entirely different and much closer in theoretical synergy to um, scholars such as Mietinen, who suggest that all epidemiological studies are variations on the same strategy to count cases moving through space and time. So there's no cohort or case control design, they're simply different points along a distribution of dynamic person time in which we can pluck individuals who have disease uh, uh, that we're interested in studying. So in researching and writing Epidemiology Matters, I began to see how the way in which we've traditionally developed our canon has led us down a particular path. And this path um, has new themes developing, which may or may not be intersecting. 
but they're germane to the question of does epidemiology matter? Because to answer the question, um, you explicitly need to know what you think epidemiology is. And this is what one of our breakout sessions today was, um, was devoted to. So here's my take on that. So when you ask people, what is epidemiology? A lot of people say it's the study of skin, sure. But when you ask epidemiologists, what is epidemiology? Usually you get answers that fall somewhere along the, these three lines. And they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but you'll see people say that epidemiology provides a framework and tools to interpret studies as causal. Or that epidemiology, what, the, what our purpose is, is to buy, provide policymakers with evidence-based recommendations. Or you could also, and, and this came up today in the themes people were talking about, that another thing that epidemiology does is we generate scientific knowledge, right? We're scientists, we generate knowledge about the distribution and determinants of disease in populations. Yet underneath each one of these general statements is a set of assumptions and controversies um, that we have to consider before we come to a consensus about why our field matters. So let's consider those. On one hand, we have the gaining dominance of potential outcomes approaches to framing our research questions in order to interpret associations as causal. One central premise of the potential outcomes approach is that there are a set of assumptions necessary to interpret an association we get from our study as a causal estimate, right? So these include things like the stable unit treatment value assumption, consistency, positivity, exchangeability, and others. And what's come from that is that we all have to be much more specific about what research question we're asking, right? Are we asking a research question that has a, causal, a potential causal answer to it? So the methodological developments in epidemiology resulting in this work have been very compelling. Um, and the basic, this basic premise has led to a remar remarkable methodological achievement in building statistical models, adjusting for confounding, assessing direct, indirect, and interactive effects. We all now have a much larger set of methods to apply and methods that allow us to build more flexible models with, and I think this is key, more flexible models with a minimum number of assumptions in order to interpret estimates as causal. But in order to make a minimum number of assumptions, we have to be asking the right questions. And that's really, I think, what the impact of these, this way of thinking has had on our field. But within these assumptions that have been articulated by methodologists developing the approaches, there's also a particular worldview about how we should think about observational epidemiology. For example, it's often written that exposure should be conceptualized as the potential randomized trial or intervention that could be done to change them. So causal questions are those in which we can be very specific about how the exposure can be changed, how it was changed. Otherwise, what you're asking is not really a causal question. There's no causal estimate that we can estimate estimate from it. And those assumptions have really forced us to be clear about our assumptions. So when we're asking our questions, when we do it in this framework, we're like, huh, I actually don't know what the RCT would be that would change this exposure. That's when you know that you've got kind of a muddy exposure that you might want to explore further. But it's also led to the suggestions that there are some questions that cannot be answered causally. For example, the question of whether obesity, smoking, or alcohol consumption affect health are not causal questions because there are many different ways in which people can become obese, in which they can lose weight, in which they can drink or not drink. What is the RCT that we're doing to reduce someone's drinking? Well, that really matters for the causal estimate that we get. Um, so the effects of those variables on health are undefinable, and furthermore, they're unhelpful to policymakers. Right, because policymakers want to know what's the intervention that I could do to change them. So this is just an example of some of this, ar the articulation of some of this argument. Um, so Hernan and Taubman eloquently laid out the case that the effects of obesity on health do not have a causal interpretation, suggesting that causal effects cannot be defined, much less computed, in the absence of a well-defined intervention. And the claim is made if our goal, again, if our goal is to inform policy, it may be better to focus on modifiable lifestyle behaviors rather than obesity itself, regardless of whether we use observational studies or randomized trials. And they suggest that by, by focusing on well-defined interventions, we avoid tackling questions that cannot be asked, logically asked in randomized experiments. So this view was met with a lot of criticism, as you can probably imagine. And here's just a couple examples of that criticism. So Sharon Schwartz and colleagues made the case that well-defined intervention assumptions are politically conservative. 
that you know, it makes us kind of the prisoners of the proximate as we, um, as a lot of people in social epi have written about, you know, if we're only allowed to ask questions that focus on modifiable lifestyle factors and not the broad, you know, kind of social forces that create distributions of obesity and alcohol consumption and smoking in populations, then how can we think, you know, really outside of the box as epidemiologists towards social change? Um, and indeed, the central counterpoint to this well-defined intervention, potential outcomes approach, has been that epidemiology is not defined by policy relevance, but instead that it's a discipline that is problem-focused and theory-informed. Identify a problem in the world, design a bunch of studies to answer that question around that problem, and then use theories to create causal stories about the world that can be tested in a variety of data, together triangulated to achieve answers. Some of those triangulations will involve well-defined interventions, and causal questions, but oftentimes they will not. So here's just another example. Jan Vandenbroek and colleagues in an article in International Journal of Epidemiology recently said, was criticizing the potential outcomes approach and saying the scientific process is much more messy and interesting and productive than this restrictive approach where we're only allowed to ask certain questions. And Nancy Krieger and George Davy Smith um, in that same issue also criticize this approach saying that causes don't cease being causes because they're a challenge to study or address. And noted in this paper and many others, there are many causes which we know have no logical interventions. And, and Rubin has written about this a lot, that the outcomes of lunar cycles and tides, the mass of the sun as a cause of planetary orbits, the effects of, even the effects of social stratification, um, none of them have well-defined interventions, but we know that they're causal. Uh, so we may know, for example, that racial discrimination is a cause of why some professors get promoted and others do not, even if it's mental gymnastics to consider the counterfactual of the totality of life as a racial and ethnic minority. The advocates of the potential outcomes approach would often answer, sure, of course we know that. Uh, but there's no practical intervention, and as such, it's not of interest to policymakers. What policymakers want to know is, how do we get better diversity in our faculty? That's the question they want to answer. So you can study the effects of social stratification, but it's just not of interest and therefore not epidemiological. So these are all important questions. They're just not epi questions. There are different disciplines questions. The latter conceptualization tends to view epidemiology as a toolkit of designs and methods that answer causal questions, with causal questions being those that are defined by well-defined interventions with direct policy relevance. Now, if there's anyone who probably disagrees with that view, it's probably Ken Rothman, who's been writing about this topic for decades. Um, and so, uh, he famously excoriated the rising tide of social epidemiology in the field by suggesting that epidemiologists should be free to pursue knowledge for its own sake without fear of being badgered about the practical relevance of our work. And so, as what Rothman has written about, it, in my interpretation, is that epidemiology is about discovery. Um, it's about applying the scientific method. It's about beginning with a theory, testing the theories, generating new knowledge about the world for the process of disease pathogenesis, regardless of whether there's a well-defined intervention, regardless of what policymakers care about. It's about discovering what causes disease. And in a controversial piece in international epidemiology several years ago, they went a step further, suggesting that the mainstays of epidemiological design, such as representative sampling, are actually of little relevance to general statements about nature. And that if we are a science making general statements about disease pathogenesis, things like representative sampling not only don't help us, but actually hurt our scientific process. In this worldview, epidemiology is a discipline that seeks to understand phenomena and the underlying process of how these distributions and populations happen. And the practical goal of applying that knowledge to a specific population is important, but it's not science. So surveys of health are important. They're just not, again, epidemiological. So different people in the field have this particular worldview about not what is important, but what is epi. But of course, there's several ironies throughout these controversies. Um, and one that was brought up uh, in the session with the journal editors um, was that well, we're all debating about the utility of well-defined interventions. Um, it's at the same time this discontent is brewing in clinical research because clinical trials continuously are non-replicated um, over and over and over again. 
uh, there's increasingly concern about shoddy science. Um, so, you know, we're holding ourselves up to this gold standard that's consistently turning out to be non-replicable. And one of the reasons it's non-replicable is that um, is through sample selection, which epidemiology knows quite a lot about and could inform those trials if they asked us. But it's to the point now that NIH, the NIH has established rigor and reproducibility criteria to stem the tide of bogus science threatening to undermine many areas of academic and clinical medicine and social science and many other fields. And of course, not to mention, it's very rare for our work to have direct policy relevance since the politics of setting policies rarely rely on evidence. So those are some of my thoughts about some of the discussions we've been having yesterday and today. And I wanted to close with an example of um, this intersection of epidemiology and policy that I've been working on, a really messily defined intervention meeting with a really messy epidemiological outcome. And the question I wanted to pose to a group is, am I doing epidemiology? Um, so gun violence and mass shootings have dominated the media cycle, um, even this week and in the last several months. This slide I created like a couple months ago, but obviously it could be updated. And when these events occur, the mental health of the shooter often becomes a focal point of the conversation. Debates ensue about whether to restrict Second Amendment rights based on mental illness, and especially um, what's often debated is whether we should expand background checks at the point of firearm sale. So it turns out that from 2007, um, the Virginia Tech shooting, to 2013, right after Sandy Hook, Mental health records went from accounting for se from 7% of all federal gun disqualifying records to 28%. But the broader question is whether mental illness is the right target for gun disqualifications and whether they will in fact reduce gun related deaths at a population level. The efficacy of background checks based on mental illness to control firearm violence depends on a large degree on the extent to which individuals with mental illness are violent and or at risk for gun related suicide. While psychiatric disorders and serious mental illness are among the strongest risk factors for suicide, the link between mental illness and interpersonal violence is much more complicated. Only a small proportion of intimate, intimate pers um, interpersonal violent behavior is attributable to psychiatric disorders, and people with psychiatric disorders are less likely than other adults to use a firearm in a violent act. But, so kind of taking aside the question of mental illness and firearm violence, and putting at the forefront mental illness and suicide, for which there's a much stronger link and a much stronger evidence base, um, we can ask the question, well, for this risk factor, mental illness, that we know to be a strong risk factor for gun-related suicide, would restrictions on gun access to the mentally ill reduce the population rates of suicide, and how broad would those restrictions need to be in order to have a population effect? So gun prohibitions linked to involuntary psychiatric hospitalization are longstanding federal policy. The Supreme Court explicitly preserved such restrictions in its 2007 landmark case, DC versus Heller. But most gun-related suicide deaths have never been involuntarily hospitalized. So that limits the, effect, uh, limits the effectiveness of point-of-purchase sale prohibitions. Um, some policymakers have called for expanding gun restrictions to include people with records of any psychiatric hospitalization, voluntary or involuntary. And there are a few states that have proposed even broader criteria, such as having any record of, psyche, of any psychiatric hospitalization in Connecticut, or even a record of any mental health treatment, the vast majority of whom would not die by suicide. So observational data and modern causal inference methods simply aren't adequate to inform the debate about gun restrictions to the mentally ill. The data are not available. There's no randomized controlled trials that are ethical or feasible. States that have restrictions don't implement them in effective ways, and the implementation is very heterogeneous. States are not exchangeable or comparable for using causal inference methods to estimate causal effects. Loopholes for gun purchasing mean that individuals who want to acquire a gun can do so outside of point of purchase sales. And further, violence and suicidal behavior occur within complex systems in which individuals and their environments iteratively interact, which violates many of the assumptions of a lot of causal inference methods, which want us to answer causal questions with a limited number of assumptions. For suicide and violence, we have to make a lot of assumptions to estimate our effect estimates that we get from our observational studies or even our randomized controlled trials as causal. So, we want to run this by simulating a population and using an agent-based model. 
Um, we simulated the population effects of gun restrictions on suicide um, for a broad range of gun restriction strategies, some of which had been enacted, some of which haven't been enacted, um, using an agent-based model with core dynamics shown here that include neighborhood characteristics, social networks, psychiatric disorders, treatment, um, we had a, uh, a whole prison system that we built inside of our agent-based model, so agents would commit crimes, they would be arrested, um, they would be convicted with certain probabilities, they'd go to Rikers, this is in New York City, where we built our model, they were incarcerated for a certain period of time, and all through that time, their mortality rates, both from homicide, suicide, and all other causes were shifting, they would be released back out into the neighborhood, and we calibrated the whole thing using available data, available data surveillance systems. Um, and these are actually just some of the layers in the agent-based model. We have actually whole other layers, including things like um, alcohol outlet density. We have police officers in the model that interact with people and stop crime. Um, so it's a pretty well-developed model at this point. And I just wanted to point out a few of our results to get us talking. So shown here, whoo, okay, there we go. <laughs> Shown here is the, and this is the um, baseline rate of firearm-related suicide in New York City um, before, you know, kind of status quo. Um, New York City ha actually has a much lower rate of firearm-related suicide and homicide than um, almost any other major city uh, in the U.S. Um, but we disqualified people from gun um, ownership based on uh, whether the New York State Office of Mental Health identified them as having a psychiatric hospitalization. So this is kind of akin to what a lot of states are proposing to do. Um, and you can see that even though, of course, psychiatric hospitalization is a strong risk factor for a subsequent gun-related suicide, there's just not enough people with OMH psychiatric hospitalizations to have an actual population benefit for gun-related suicide. So among the high-risk group, we, pre we prevent, among people who had been identified as OMH psychiatric hospitalizations, depending on our simulation, we prevented on average 80% of subsequent gun-related suicides. But at a population level, we made no impact. In fact, of all of our interventions that we did, okay, there we go. Um, essentially, you would have to disqualify anyone who had ever had any history of mental health treatment of any kind. I mean, you, you talk to a psychiatrist for depression, you've just had your Second Amendment right restricted. Um, you would need to go to that level, which is not only probably unconstitutional, uh, but certainly would restrict the rights of millions of people who otherwise would not be a threat to society um, in order to reduce firearm-related hospitalization. And if you actually estimate the number needed to treat, you would need to disqualify 750,000 people in New York City um, from gun purchasing for each suicide prevented. So in addition to being unfeasible, it's also not equitable, right? Um, embedded inequalities, long-standing disparities in access to treatment would be replicated in gun disqualifying records. For example, while racial ethnic minorities have less access to mental health care and receive lower quality of care on average, rates of things like involuntary psychiatric hospitalization and civil commitment are higher, um, including in New York. And the extent to which such criteria would be used for gun disqualification, we would then be reproducing disparities over time. So the question I want to raise for debate is whether this was epidemiology. We addressed a public health problem with a really poorly defined intervention, with variable implementation and problems across jurisdictions, for an outcome that is very complex, that's affected by multiple systems across space and time. But we actually demonstrated some of the foundational concepts in population health science, which is that there's limitations of high-risk approaches, and they're limited by, uh, in terms of population benefits, and they're limited by the size of the high-risk population. Um, and we tried to better guide policy um, by showing the bounds of plausibility of what you could do with this one type of intervention. So questions about what epidemiology is and how it's situated alongside population health science led me to write a a uh, second book with Sandra Galea, which was published in 2016, um, called Population Health Science. And at its core, what this book tried to do and how we tried to differentiate ourselves from the discipline of epidemiology, which I think was a great discussion about, like, is this just rebranding? Um, I don't think it is. Um, but what we tried to demonstrate in that book was that what population health science is, is focusing on understanding the world in addition to intervening on it, by explicitly defining no exposure as non-manipulatable, only our creativity and vision is non-manipulatable, and social justice and equity must be at the forefront 
of our ways of approaching improving population health. So we were guided by theoretical writing and foundational scholars in the areas of community science and epidemiology. And in particular, with this centennial anniversary, I want to acknowledge the writings of Wade Hampton Frost, George Comstock, my own mentors, including Guo Ha Li, um, who were all uh, faculty, preeminent faculty in this department. And what we tried to do in the book was start a discussion about the foundational principles of a new discipline of population health science, new, new being old, kind of re-energizing a lot of the concepts from um, these scholars' writings throughout history. And, and in an effort to energize discussion and research among epidemiologists for whom there's a disquiet about the fundamental assumptions and subsequent implications of current epidemiological approaches for community-based medicine and prevention. So what we talk about in the book are core tenets, such as the causes of cases are different than the causes of incidents, the prevention paradox, the role of causal partners in producing population health patterns of disease that differ across geographic locations, equity and efficiency of interven intervention and return on health investments, and the very limited role of individualized prediction for understanding population health patterns. So it's with these principles that I try to guide my research and teaching and hope to discuss with all of you today. Thank you. So I think we're gonna hold questions for uh, the actual panel, unless there's only like clarification questions that you wanna quickly ask. As a... Okay, so we're good. So in terms of our next speaker is uh, Dr. Roberta Ness, um, who is uh, Dean of University of Texas School of Public Health and has, what? Was. Was, sorry and um, has published in uh, innovation as well as the future of epidemiology as well. Um, I have no slides. Yeah, so she has no slides, so I'm just gonna move this off. Okay. Thank you. Many of you, first of all, thank you so much for the honor of being involved in this symposium which very appropriately celebrates 100 years at Hopkins Department of Epidemiology. Um, my title and theme is, as you saw, training inventive thinkers in epidemiology. And in keeping with that theme, I am PowerPoint na uh, naked. <laughs> so that may be surprising, shocking to some of you. Um, but it goes along with the definition that I use of innovation, which I believe is surprise in the service of health and prosperity. So I thought about coming naked, but I thought that was probably too much of a shock. Um, but I am going to share with you a surprising revelation, this is no joke, that I have not previously publicly shared. And that is um, that recently I failed big time, failed big time. Um, I have widely argued that revolutionary innovation has been slowing since the turn of the 20th century. Um, and I now, in thinking about it very deeply for a long time, believe I was wrong. Um, when I look around and I look at microbiome research and quantum applications, CRISPR and regenerative medicine, deep learning by computers and robots, robotics, and the, even the social revolution being created by the web, these are truly revolutionary such that in the future, humans will think and behave utterly differently than they do today. Now, I think there were a lot of reasons that I got it wrong, but unfortunately, one of those reasons is that I was coming at this question through the prism of my discipline of epidemiology. And I fear that epidemiology has not made radical change in the last couple of decades or more. Um, so why is that? 
I think there are lessons to be learned from these examples, these disciplines, in which we have truly seen revolutionary innovation. So what are those? I'm going to suggest four of them. One, visionary cult leaders. So in the past, we have had heroic fig figures in science that have made singular insights, such as Goldberger and the nutritional uh, basis of pellagra, such as Al Sommer and vitamin A leading to blindness. It's not what happens today. Today, we get passionate scientific gurus who are nudging, organizing groups of altruistic volunteers and hackers. And they are tapping in to that set of diverse intelligences. They are not trying to lead. They're not trying to be superior as much as they're trying to embrace the democracy of the internet. The second is audaciousness. In the past, we've heard in this symposium that Hopkins School of Public Health focused on the great threats of the day. So tuberculosis, polio, smallpox, smoking. Not only did they focus on those threats, but they focused on the outrageous notion that those health threats and their effects could be eradicated. The biggest threats today, I would argue, some of the biggest threats today, I would argue, to health and prosperity are climate change, longevity leading to social and economic disruption, whether you like it or not, and global conflict. Now, epidemiology has focused heavily on methods, and methods are terribly important. You know, take, for example, PCR, CRISPR. Um, I would actually argue that in some ways the process has been more impactful than the products. But, but, CRISPR, PCR, and other um, methods that have come from these revolutionary areas are instantly implemented, instantly put to practical use. There is no, let's say, latency. There is no, in, in many cases, there's not even a differential in the people that are involved. Um, so climate change, longevity, global conflict, is epidemiology focusing on those? The third, um, is the third of these uh, lessons is contentiousness and obstinacy. So it's the willingness to destroy all that came before. That's what revolutions are unfortunately about, or fortunately about. Um, in examples, the microbiome reverses fundamental notions of infectious disease such that microbes are no longer harmful, and we don't control them necessarily, but in fact, microbes are symbiotes, and they control us. Secondly, second example, deep learning reverses the notion that humans must program and manipulate robots. Now, Ray Kurzweil got this right. Um, a lot of people thought he didn't. But in, in The Serendipity is Near, he predicted that robots would be creating future robots, teaching future robots, and learnings, learning as humans do, and the sky's the limit. And the fourth lesson is fumbling. So epidemiology believes very strongly in perfection. New areas see perfection as the enemy of the good. So for instance, we don't see Apple uh, failing, refusing to release its new iPhone because it's not going to behave perfectly in every function. They are perfectly happy to put that new iPhone out, make 
billions of dollars and simply know that the imperfections are going to allow the population to race to get the next version of the next iPhone. So the, the fact of the matter is they do not wait for perfection. They act iteratively, and that not only is good enough, but it's very, very good. So this is going to be short and sweet, but just to summarize, what have I said? I said in teaching the next generation of epidemiologists, particularly along the theme of innovation and creativity and revolution and true progress, what should we be teaching? We should teach them to be cult builders, audacious, obstinate, and fumbling. Now, many of you may see those characteristics as ones that we use to describe our political administration at the moment, but they are not characteristics that we value and that we feel compelled to pass on to the next generation of our trainees. So I believe that here are the things we should not be doing. We should not be teaching them to be overly focused. You know, how many of us have said focus? I have. I think pretty much every, every lecturer and faculty member in the room has done that. Um, we should teach them not to be humble. I saw up on one of the slides today, you know, we have to be humble, and we don't have to be humble. We shouldn't be humble. Um, we should teach them not to feel like they deeply need to understand something before intervening, and not even always that they need to apply the precautionary principle. It's pretty radical. Um, we should teach them not to keep research close to the chest for fear of losing priority. And we should teach them not to fear being advocates. We are all biased. We are all biased. And our advocacy is advocacy in the name of evidence-based public health. And that's a good thing. Better that we should say that than somebody else comes along who doesn't know what they're talking about. So this is a call to arms. Now, I admit my personal failure publicly. I'm willing to be humiliated for the sake of personal and professional growth. Are you? Is epidemiology? Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Fox. And Dr. Matthew Fox is a professor of epidemiology and global health at Boston University and is also uh, has a nice podcast called Free Associations for the students who don't know that yet. I highly recommend it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. By the way, please do uh, download the podcast. My mom highly recommends it. <laughs> Um, I, I want to start by thanking the uh, organizers for inviting me, and this is such a phenomenal uh, thing to be part of. 100 years is really uh, amazing. And being invited to be part of the, the 100th birthday celebrations, I will not lie to you, I was uh, a little confused at first. I was thinking birthday, you know, ice cream, balloons, maybe a pinata, something fun. Uh, but this is actually way better, the opportunity to actually look forward and the opportunity to look back at the same time. So recently I, um, I had a important birthday. It's not the one you're thinking, I'm not that old. But important birthdays give you uh, an opportunity to, to, to do exactly that, look forward and look back. And I've gotten to the age at which I have started to wonder whether I have more years in front of me or more years behind me. And when you get to that point, uh, you start to ask some, some big questions. For me, there was really two. The first one is the obvious one. You, you start to make a bucket list, and you think through all those things that you want to get done in the rest of your life. It turned out the only thing that I actually was on my bucket list was to completely submit a manuscript to a journal without having to reset my journal password. Uh, 
So that didn't turn out to be too interesting, but the, the other question, and the one that I want, to keep, I want you to keep in mind during this talk is I started to think about, well, if I could go back to another period of my life, knowing what I know now, would I choose to do it, or do I think that there's more opportunities going forward, and that's really what I want to see? And that's what I want you to think about as I uh, talk about what I think about uh, as the future of epidemiologic teaching and how we might think about what we want to do in terms of training future students, and in particular, I'm going to focus on doctoral students going forward. And so, uh, there's two, so if I learned anything from the, the talk yesterday by the Alda Center, uh, it was really two things. Uh, the first is that uh, epidemiologists have very differing views as to what a basketball is. <laughs> but the, uh, the second point is that you should give the, the lead the take home message first. And so I'm going to do that, which is to say, I have two things that I want you to think about. The first is uh, that we live in an amazing era, an amazing time in terms of epidemiology because we are at the uh, conflation of two really, really amazing things. The development of methods that are gonna allow us to answer questions that we really never could answer before and to answer them correctly, and big data. And that is a phenomenal opportunity. But at the same time, what I worry about is that uh, we may be doing this, this focus on methods, this focus on big data, at the expense of some of the really basic principles of epidemiologic research um, that, that are gonna be essential for us to be able to implement these novel methods in ways that we can get answers to the questions that we want. And the second point is that all the methods in the world are not gonna allow us to answer a question if we don't know what the question is. We have to know what the questions that we wanna ask are. We have to be able to ask them clearly in order to be able to get good answers. So first, thinking about novel methods. So how many, uh, by show of hands, how many uh, students do we still have left in the room? Okay, a good number of you, fantastic. Um, so I went through and just listed out, sort of off the top of my head, things that, that seemed to me to be novel methods. So we're in the era of the causal inference revolution and quantification of error and all kinds of novel methods. So just by show of hands, how many of you would say in your classroom experience you have learned at least half of these methods? How many of you would say at least half of these methods? Okay, how many of you, by show of hands, would say you've implemented outside of coursework at least one of these methods? Okay, how many, at least three? Okay, show me, how many of you, at least five? 10? Okay, that's a, that's a real credit to you. How many of you, uh, by show of hands, just hate being asked in a lecture to raise your hand? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, the point here is that you actually are receiving phenomenal training if you have learned most of these things, and in addition to which, you've already had the opportunities to apply them. And this is, this is really fantastic, but I do, have, uh, I do have some worries about this. So I really, there's two things that um, fundamentally uh, I worry about. The first is that um, I am, I'm afraid that we are teaching novel methods at the expense of teaching people how to ask good questions. And the second thing I'm afraid of is spiders. <laughs> and I can get over my fear of spiders by myself, but if we are gonna teach students to be able to ask good questions, this is something that we are all gonna to have to do together. And, sorry. And I think the, this was, was said incredibly well by our hosts in the, the uh, publication in, the IJ, in IJE, when they said the rise of causal, the causal inference framework, counterfactuals, directed acyclic graphs, and newer analytic methods grew naturally as we aimed to define and explain cause. However, are we so dedicated to perfecting the method that the science gets lost? And what I wonder is, if we are getting this good at all of these different methods, are we training people to be technicians, people who can implement phenomenal methods, or are we training scientists, people who can ask good questions and identify the method that is necessary to be able to answer that question? And I think ideally, we need to be doing both. And so as I said, we've got this phenomenal opportunity. We're at a place where big data and novel methods are colliding. Um, and I said to you a minute ago, I have two fears. That isn't true. I've got many fears. Another one that I have, uh, is that we 
in the era of big data and the era of novel methods have more and more opportunities to answer questions, and I think uh, someone said it yesterday in the video, to identify data sets that are so big that they can tell us the wrong answers. And we can become enamored of our data because it is so big. And so I think that we need to think very carefully about what it is we want to be asking and how it is we're going to ask it. So if we think about the way that we normally work in epidemiology, typically what we do is we go out, we do our studies, and then we do some sort of quantification assessment of random error. We have confidence intervals, we have p-values, whatever it is that you're using to assess random error. And then we get to the systematic error. Where do we get to that? We get to that in the discussion section after we've already drawn conclusions about our data. Right? We call this the confessing your sins approach. Right? I tell you that I've done it, and therefore I can just move on and talk past it. Well, in the era of big data, random error is going to go away. And when random error goes away, systematic error becomes the dominant source of error. We become more and more confident in the wrong answers. And so if we don't think about ways to actually quantify systematic error, not just to discuss it, not just to think about it, but to think about total study error, we're going to end up getting the wrong answers, and we're going to get them with extreme confidence. And I think that's something we need to be really careful about. So uh, how many of you have read the, the Episcope paper? Has anyone read the Episcope paper? So this was like considered essential when I, I did my training, essential reading. And the basic idea is it's a model for thinking about how we view epidemiologic data. So the idea is that we are all the epidemiologist in the bottom right. We all have receding hairlines. And we are trying to answer a question on the top left. They've termed that agency because they wanted to make it all go in alphabetical order. But the idea is we want to answer some question. And we view the answer to that question filtered through a series of steps through a series of, of uh, lenses which change what we actually observe when we're trying to get at cause and effect. So in the top left, you have what we're trying to get at. And then the next steps are all the things that you normally think about as the things that distort our ability to assess cause and effect, your confounding, your random error, the analytic choices that we make. Then on the far right, you get to issues of inference and, and publication bias. And all these distort the picture of the effect that we are trying to observe. Novel methods, which is where I think we have rightly spent a lot of time focused, focus on everything from about B down to H and maybe I. And that's fantastic. We have gotten really good at developing methods to be able to answer these questions. But that only does us good if we actually know what the question is. If we're not asking the right questions, and we don't know what the questions are that we are trying to ask, it doesn't matter how much distortion there is, the effects estimates that we get won't actually have the meaning that we want them to. So in thinking about training, we have all these novel methods. We only have so much time in the curriculum to be able to teach students. And so we have to think very carefully about what is going to get crowded out if we're going to add new methods in. And this is where my concern comes from the idea that we are training technicians and not scientists. I'm not saying we're doing that. I'm saying that's my worry as to what we're going to do. Um, so again, just by show of hands, how many of you have ever taken a class in how to ask a question? Ask a scientific question. A few of you. How many of you had, say, a lecture on it? Yeah, most of this gets often for us boiled down to a question. Now, there's different sides to this, right? On the one hand, we want to teach people how to think of good questions. But we also want to teach people how to formulate good questions. If that gets crowded out, along with all these other things that we're already missing, then I think we have to think really carefully about what it is we are training people to do. Um, and my worry, by the way, is that because of this specialization because of all these novel methods that we want to teach people, that programs of epidemiology are going to naturally bifurcate into those that focus on methods and those that focus on uh, implementation and study design, and we're going to get lost in between. 
So I think we need to be thinking really carefully about what epi training looks like going forward, right? What do our current emphasis on methods crowd out? And I think it's some of the basics. I think we de-emphasize study design in favor of analytic methods that we can use to solve problems. I'm not arguing we should get rid of those methods, but I am arguing that we need to rethink what the balance is in terms of how much time we spend on study design and how much time we spend on analytic methods. But fundamentally, for me, it comes down to whether or not we can train people to ask good questions. So what do I mean by that? So let me tell you a story about a student of mine. Uh, I know many people in this room do HIV research, but for those of you who don't, uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. So uh, I do work on HIV in South Africa, where the big questions over the past decade have all been about when do we initiate HIV treatment? And Historically, when we started uh, providing access to antiretroviral therapy, we rationed care by limiting to those who had very low CD4 counts. CD4 count is your measure of immune function, so essentially, we waited until you got sick, and then we provided you with treatment, and we hoped that that would bring you back. Okay? Now, over time, as more evidence was generated, many by people in this room, it became clearer and clearer that earlier treatment was better. And in fact, trials have now demonstrated that it's probably best to be initiating patients as soon as they're diagnosed. Call that test and treat. And that's been shown really convincingly with randomized trial data. But as we all know, trial data doesn't always represent what's actually happening in the real world. So a student of mine said, I want to look at the effects of initiating patients at lower CD4 counts compared to initiating patients at higher CD4 counts on their risk of attrition dropping out of HIV care. And so that was the proposal, and the student compared two groups of patients, those initiating at low CD4 counts, those initiating at high CD4 counts, and lo and behold, we found that patients who initiated higher CD4 counts are more likely to drop out of care, and you can hypothesize that that is because patients who are initiating at higher CD4 counts haven't experienced the effects of the illness yet and don't have the same motivation to be engaged in care. Now, the problem with this is it doesn't answer the relevant question. In fact, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure what that analysis actually answered at all. The relevant question to a person who has a patient in front of them is, should I initiate this, and that patient, let's say, has a high CD4 count, do I initiate this patient on treatment now, or do I wait until their CD4 count drops? Well, if I wait, Patients can die during the period at which I'm waiting. And therefore, if I choose to compare patients because I have data on them, some of whom initiated at high CD4 counts and some of whom initiated at low CD4 counts, I'm essentially answering a question of what happens if you initiate at high CD4 counts compared to what happens if you wait, have some unspecified magical intervention that keeps people alive to be able to initiate when their CD4 count drops and see what happens. Right? That's not a relevant question, and in fact, it's not the important question. Okay, now the confession. That student was me. <laughs> right? This is a mistake that I made because I wasn't thinking through how to ask a good question. This wasn't a fundamental part of my training, and this is what we refer to as the have data, can't analyze, what's the question problem. Right? We do this all the time. Data is readily available, we have questions in our mind that we want answered, but those questions are not often formulated in terms of a question that is a scientific question. It is formulated in terms of an analysis I can do. An analysis, a comparison of two populations, is not the same as a question. And so I actually share much of the concern that Kerry raised about this idea of hypothetical randomized trials, and yet I am still a huge proponent in this idea that if you want to do an observational study, first think through the hypothetical randomized trial that you would do if you could. If I had done that and designed my observational study to mimic the clinical trial that I would have done, it would have been immediately obvious to me that I had a problem, that I was doing something wrong, that I was answering a question that had no meaning. 
I'm not arguing that this is the end all be all. I am not arguing that randomized trials are better than observational studies. I have heard all the arguments against this approach. But fundamentally, if we are gonna teach people to ask good questions, this is where we start. This is where I believe we start. And I do wanna just add one thing to the, to the question about well-defined interventions and obesity, because I, I agree this debate has gone into some, some strange places that don't necessarily uh, better us as a field. But I think there are some caveats to this that I think are important. And this is an example that, that came from uh, Maria Glymore. So if we think of obesity as just a, a, a marker for a series of pathways by which you can get to obesity, the things that we might want to intervene on are those things that might have gotten a person to the obese state in the first place. So we may want to intervene on diet. We may want to intervene on exercise. We may want to intervene on depression. Ultimately, we may want to intervene on genetics. But the thing to think about is that the effect estimates that we will get from observational studies which compare the obese to the non-obese populations are not the same estimates that we would get if we started to think about interventions that we would do if we could. And that isn't just because obesity is not a well-defined intervention. It's also because those interventions will have effects on outcomes independent of the thing that we are interested in. And so if we think about exercise-based interventions, there are pathways by which exercise will affect mortality that have nothing to do with obesity. And if we're gonna think about policy-relevant interventions and strategies and structures, then we need to think through these questions in a way that gets at the causal question we are trying to answer. So I think that we need to be very careful as we go forward to think about what are we adding to our curriculum and what are we taking away in order to make space for that. And I think the one thing that we have to make sure we don't leave behind is the ability to ask a good question. So I'll end where I began, which is to say, if we could go back to another time, to an earlier time, when we were probably better than we are now at the basics of epidemiology, would I go back? And the answer to that is no. I think we have actually gotten better. But my worry is that if we don't refocus ourselves, think very carefully about the questions we're gonna ask and how we're gonna ask them, at the expense of learning newer and more novel methods, I think ultimately we do ourselves a disservice. So thank you very much. Uh, I think, no questions? Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Alan Wilcox, who is a senior scientist at uh, the NIEHS and just pull up his slides. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to be at this session, which uh, is fun. I've learned a lot. And I'm not sure um, how much I have to contribute, but let me throw in my two cents worth. Um, I accepted this invitation before I really knew what they wanted me to talk about. And here there's this thing about soft skills. Am I not going to look like a scientist? Well. Let me try and persuade you that soft skills actually are an important part of hard science. So what I'm going to define as the soft skills of science that we really need to know something about are creativity, collaboration, and communication, which we've heard a lot about. These are soft in the sense that they're not very measurable, and they're hard to teach. But I hope I can persuade you that they are just as essential to our work as good methods are. So I'm going to start with creativity. And to talk about something as amorphous as creativity, we have to resort to metaphors. And so the metaphor I'm going to start with is this one, which you'll recognize as kind of the left brain, right brain idea. And I have to start off with an apology and an acknowledgement that this has nothing to do with neuroanatomy, yeah. right? Uh, we really don't have a creative side and an, and a, an objective side. That's, that's not the case. But it's still a nice example of what I'm trying to show. It's a nice metaphor, a little poetry. So on one side, we have these subjective qualities of passion and intuition and spontaneity and obliviousness to time that uh, we associate with 
uh, with the creative artistic processes. And on the other side, we have a whole sheaf of qualities that actually we associate with science. And I think you'll agree that this is where we live. When we present our findings at a scientific meeting, when we write our results, we do our best to be as objective and logical and impartial and rigorous as we can. This is what's drilled into us, this is our culture. But I think one consequence of that emphasis has been to create this sense that there's a dichotomy here, that you're either a scientist or you're an artist. And we live over on the science side and the other side is something we have to kind of ignore or repress or uh, it's irrelevant. And so what I want to propose to you is another metaphor altogether. I think this is not the right metaphor. I think we should think more in terms of this. Yin and yang, two forces that define each other, that work together to make the whole, that are in this dynamic equilibrium. And then in fact, we can't do good science without both sides of this. So this, all this stuff on the right is where ideas come from, it's where we get our our intuitions about science. It's how we discover new things. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna let you uh, take it from Einstein, who said there's no logical way to discovery. Methods are not going to do it. Intuition does it. We have to figure out what the right question is. What do we wanna solve? And then, then we apply all these other things that we've learned that help us to evaluate the ideas, weed out the things that don't work, and rest our knowledge on the firm basis of logic and rigor. But we don't get there only by working on, on that left side. So what happens if these two sides get out of balance? So there's kind of two extremes. On the one side, we've got uh, a kind of atrophy of all those creative uh, uh, impulses, and we're the accountant researcher, right? We're the guy who deals with numbers. Uh, our research is going to be correct because we're gonna make sure all the numbers add up. Uh, it's not gonna be that interesting, actually. Probably not gonna be important, and for sure, it's not gonna be fun. <laughs> so what's the other extreme? I think this is the side we're more afraid of as scientists. It's the crackpot scientist, right? So these uh, are, are the, this is the kind of work that uh, if we're all over there without all the rigorous things on the left, then our research is certainly gonna be imaginative, interesting, it's gonna be ungrounded and untested, and it could be completely wrong out in left base. So, we really need both of these things. And I think Matt laid the groundwork very nice by saying that methods aren't, and, and a lot of other discussions here, that methods aren't going to solve our most important problems, which are what are the problems that we want to address. So let me move to these uh, other two things. Collaboration, this has come up several times in, uh, in, in this uh, symposium. I have three personal rules that have done me very well for my whole career. I strongly recommend them. The first rule is to find colleagues who are smarter than you are and work with them. Now there's two great advantages here. One is that for most of us, it's not that hard to find these people. <laughs> and the other is that when we work with them, they're gonna make us look smarter than we really are. Than we really are. And I can say I have personally benefited from this. So the second rule is that you should always be generous in giving your colleagues credit for the collaborative work that you do. There's two reasons for this. One is that it still won't be enough credit that you give them. And the second is that they may even return the favor, and that's really a, a, a nice setting to be in. 
So my third rule is ask your colleagues for advice, even when you don't think you need it. So I think we oftentimes want to appear perfect. We want to not present ourselves in our unformed uh, state. We don't want to put our ideas out there when they're a little bit fuzzy. We want to somehow get it perfect. The way to get it perfect is to share your imperfections with your colleagues, with the ones you trust, and let them tell you what the problems are. Collaboration is so important for helping us hone our ideas and get them right. So the main reason to ask for colleagues, even when you don't think you need it, is because you really do need it. So one setting is in reviewing manuscripts. I mean, we all get our manuscripts reviewed when we send them out for, uh, to a journal. But if you can find colleagues in your own circle of collaborators who are willing to read your manuscripts, colleagues who aren't your co-authors, and to give you honest feedback, your papers will be much better. And of course, you have to return that favor. And the second thing here is you should always practice your talks. So I practiced this talk last week, and I got some really good suggestions that uh, I'm, I'm glad I got. Even a short 15-minute walk talk on, you know, something that's not all that complicated, this talk was improved a lot. So the reward of collaboration, and I hope I've, you've got the implication, is that if you can trust your colleagues and share with your colleagues and encourage your colleagues and give them credit, you can develop the kind of trust that will help you in so many ways, figuring out how your own intuitions uh, might come into develop into some good ideas, figuring out how to communicate clearly. So that brings us to communication. And uh, we've had a lot about communication in, in this session. I'm certainly not an expert on this. I've got just a few things to say about it. And the obvious is that, you know, data don't speak for themselves. We have to speak for our data. And we do it in so many ways. We do it in speaking in writing, in pictures. We haven't, it hasn't been that much about pictures in this symposium, but um, being able to express our results compellingly and graphically is, is a huge advantage in, in getting our ideas across. So uh, first let me say something about in writing. Um, clearly you have to know what you want to say. You have to have a clear story. And being able to tell your results in a narrative form uh, is, is really a great advantage. And of course, saying it plainly. We had a nice illustration of, uh, with our uh, exercises about speaking in plain language. It's always good to get feedback from your colleagues. Refer to above. And then this is about editing. So I'm, I'm an editor. I, you know, I, I, did this for a long time, and uh, what I learned is that nobody's a good writer. Everybody has to work at it. Don't tell yourself, oh, they write good papers, but that's just because they have a gift for it. That's baloney. You ask anybody who you think is a good writer and ask them how many drafts their papers go through. So it's very important to revise, to revise, to cut. I think cutting is an important part of editing just because you need to get some of the shaft away so you can see the, the core of things. And so when I was an editor, I came with, up with this philosophy about editing that is like a good haircut, that it makes the stuff that's left over look better. So don't feel crushed when your colleagues reading your paper saying this whole section needs to come out. Figure out a way to make it work. In pictures, so I have, um, we haven't talked about graphics, and I, there's, there's a whole lot to say here that uh, I'm not even an expert at, but since I saw a lot of uh, figures as an editor and tried to help people make them more clear, I'm gonna give you my 60 seconds of instructions how to make your graphs better. So I'm gonna start with a graph, and this is showing, um, this is the, well, it's hard to read, it's, it's a little bit small, but it's showing the cumulative uh, uh, age of puberty for boys compared to girls. That's age on the x-axis and 
uh, the cumulative distribution in the y-axis. So what can we do to make this better? So there's one very curious clue I'm going to give you, and I don't know why it, it works, but somehow graphs almost always look better if you can make them squarish. Don't ask me. It, it works. So now let's think about how we can improve the structure of this thing. Um, so, you know, first of all, color. Color is great for decoration, but you shouldn't be decorating your graphs. If it's for communicating, that's fine. But otherwise, get rid of the colors that aren't important. Um, there's a lot of stuff here that's unimportant, like all of these horizontal lines in here. I mean, really. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. So um, you, can, you can look at a graph and say, what's really essential here? Let's get rid of the line at the top and all the horizontal lines. Let's, we don't need to have the half uh, year marks on the x-axis. And why do we have a little key for these two lines? I mean, why do we have to go back and forth between a key and the lines to know what they are? Let's put the labels on the lines. Let's simplify things here. So now, look how much I've gotten rid of. There's no color. There's no extra lines. The labels are right on the lines. And there's only one more thing to do. And it's the most important thing of all. Do you remember I started out saying, now this graph is kind of hard, but let me show you what's on it. How many times have you heard that said in a lecture? It drives me crazy. If you can't see it on the slide, don't show it. Make the fonts big, make the graph simple, and make it completely readable. So now we're going to compare these two. On the left, you've got a graph like many I saw as an editor. On the right is the kind of graph I'd like to see as a reader, something I can glance at and say, oh, I know what that says. So the soft skills, creativity, collaboration, communication, they actually all come together in a very important way. The most thrilling parts of my work are those hours that I spend with my colleagues in front of a blackboard, over a big sheet of paper, struggling with a question. And in that setting where you trust each other, people have different expertise to bring to it, you can draw the problem, you can kick around alternatives, that's where things happen. That's where we feel like we really make progress. All of these skills, creativity, communication, collaboration, they all reinforce each other. So my conclusion is that we need to develop these. I don't, how to do that is a good question. We can talk about that further. We need to raise our awareness of how important they are. We need to value them. We need to practice them. And there's two essential reasons that I'll leave you with. One is these soft skills will make us better scientists producing better science. That's the first. And what could possibly be the second? What's as important as that? It's fun. And if we don't have fun, we're not, we're not doing our job. These are the things that make our work the kind of the reason you want to get up in the morning and get to the office, to have those kinds of moments. So I hope, um, I hope we can all have more of those. Thank you. Okay, so our last speaker is uh, Dr. Barbara Mahan, who is Director of Division of Bacterial Sciences at uh, CDC. And, uh, and so, you know, I think your perspective brings uh, a, a perspective that we don't actually quite often very, hear very much, and that is in terms of applied public health. So, please. Hi. Um, happy birthday. Um, I've been thinking about whether to tell you my favorite epidemiologist birthday joke, and I guess I will. Um, uh, <laughs> I have a friend who, when he turned 50, his epidemiologist friend said to him, isn't it nice to know that you're no longer at risk for premature mortality? <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know how that translates for school. Like, isn't it nice to know that you're no longer at risk for premature irrelevancy? You know, not that you ever were. Um, this is such a, an amazing place, and it's fantastic. 
I mean, I'm just um, thrilled to have been able to spend this day and a half with, with you and, and to learn so much about Hopkins. I'm, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of the mecca, so, uh, so thank you. Um, I'm the, I, w I work at CDC in the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases where I'm the director of the Division of Bacterial Diseases. And um, as all of you know, um, CDC <clears throat> um, does surveillance, outbreak response, a lot of laboratory science and a lot of epidemiologic science, all in the interest of developing evidence-based information, um, evidence, uh, to inform good policy decisions. And um, Brian asked us uh, all, I want to say that I am the only one of this group that has actually followed the direction, right, <laughs> to start our talks by, a, by ask, ask, answering the question of what do epidemiologists bring to the multidisciplinary table. Well, at CDC, epidemiologists are really, um, in many ways, the, the hub, the foundation, the center of, of the organization. Um, and what, our work is inherently multidisciplinary, um, but I do see all, epidemiologists as being the hub of that circle. And that's because epidemiologists have the ability to talk with, understand, translate to the, from the clinical sciences, the physicians, the veterinarians, the dentists, the data scientists, the statisticians, the programmers, and also the, the, the third hand, um, the policy and communications people. So the epidemiologists, I think more than any of those groups, um, are at high risk for being able to actually do the translation between all those groups that we need um, to do our work well. There's another thing that epidemiologists bring that let them, when, when they're doing it well, um, serve that hub function um, uh, in a way that really serves the public. And that is that epidemiologists, uh, to a greater extent than any of those other disciplines, have a deep understanding of bias in all its forms how to sniff for it, how to find it, how to understand what its influence is going to be on the results, and how that affects what conclusions can be drawn from the work that's been done. Um, so we need epidemiologists and that epidemiologic thinking to kind of keep us on the right track. Uh, as I was talking with one of my colleagues about this, he said, the epi has to be the sheriff. And, and that's, that's, that's right, we, we need the epidemiologists to be the sheriff who makes sure that we stick to the straight and narrow in the work that we're doing um, to serve the public health. Uh, the challenge, though, is that what makes a good applied epidemiologist isn't necessarily exactly the same thing as what makes a good academic epidemiologist, and it isn't necessarily exactly what epidemiologists who come to CDC have learned in their training. Uh, you know, we have every year um, uh, about 70 or 80 uh, epidemiologists come into the Epidemic Intelligence Service, many of them from Hopkins, and um, they arrive eager to apply the methods that they've used, the, the sophisticated um, approaches that we've um, um, been, been talking about over the last day and a half. And um, they often realize when they get there that although those methods have value, they're not necessarily what's needed for the problems that are facing them. And so <clears throat> the, the reason that, um, so I, on this next slide, I'm going to show you some of the epi aid investigations over the last several years that um, EIS officers have gone out uh, into the field um, to do. And what you see in these, um, the, just, the just from the titles of these um, uh, epiades, is that often these are problems that need an urgent response. They, they are, they're they're, they're time, um, time urgent um, situations where we need a good answer fast. And that isn't necessarily, the epidemiologists often find that they need to learn some new skills in order to be able to do this. So um, 
I um, gave a talk about um, gaps in doctoral training for applied epidemiology at SER and that Brian heard, and I think that's why he invited me here. For that talk, um, I decided that I would pretend that we were the CDC Department of Epidemiology. There is no such department. Um, and that we would design a course, I would design a course on what you would need to be a good um, applied epidemiologist at CDC. And to prepare for this, um, for this, uh, to, to, for this course, I talked with a bunch of my colleagues, most of whom are epi PhDs, about the things that they felt that they needed when they got to, C to, C to CDC and what they felt like incoming, newly minted doctoral epidemiologists um, needed that they, had, that they didn't already have. And this is my um, uh, curriculum advisory committee. Uh, a couple of the faces dropped off, I'm not sure why. Uh, this is, so this is some, but not all, of my um, informants. And um, a, I don't know, I have a special prize for the person who can choose, pick out the recent Hopkins um, graduate from this uh, group of faces. There's at least one here. Um, these people uh, work across multiple different areas in, at CDC. I've listed them on the right. Um, they finished their PhD anywhere between two years ago and 25 or more years ago. You can see it's a little bit um, skewed towards infectious disease, that's, because that's where I work. Um, but it's not exclusively infectious disease, and I heard the same themes from people across all uh, types of, um, of areas. So let's get into the course then. And the course is mine, not theirs, so if you don't like it, um, you don't blame them. <laughs> so the first module in our course is going to have uh, seven modules, or six in a capstone. The first is going to be on surveillance. How do we know what the problem is? Surveillance is, um, to a great, very large extent, what um, applied public health at the global, national, state, local level uses to know what the problems are that are affecting the population and to know where they should be focusing their work. Every single person I spoke with said that they had not learned enough about surveillance in their doctoral training. So in this module, um, we will focus on surveillance as a science in its own right. We'll talk about active surveillance, passive surveillance, sentinel surveillance, laboratory-based surveillance, how you um, select a surveillance approach for a given problem, the pros and cons in terms of speed, sensitivity, timeliness, of um, cost of different approaches to surveillance. Why the approach that you would choose if the goal of your surveillance is to detect outbreaks is different than the approach you would choose if that's not the goal of your surveillance. Um, so that, that's going to be our first module. Here's um, some examples of um, stuff that's in the news from um, recent, um, rec re CCC recently in the news. And you can see in all of these cases, it's basically it is surveillance data. The next module, and um, Matt, I know, will um, come in as a guest lecturer for this one, is how to identify a consequential question, or you know, what, what, why does what you are going to do matter? Um, the director of the EIS program emphasized to me that he spends an inordinate amount of his time talking with trainees about this. Because so often they look at, well, what can I do? I can do an analysis, I'll do it, and haven't thought about why would it matter? And his point is that you need, really need to know, even before you start doing it, what, not what the result will be, but what the action would be taken on the basis of the, the, the set of possible results. And if you can't answer that, it's not worth doing. So my favorite example about this is um, of an inconsequential question was um, uh, an epi aid that was done in response to a, um, it was an act of domestic terrorism a while ago. I won't tell you which one. And um, somebody went out and did an investigation and came back and the main result was that the closer you were to the explosion, the more likely you were to get hurt. <laughs> it, I mean, <laughs> now, a few years later, there was another one of these acts, and the investigation showed that 
basically the, the association of sleep deprivation with injury among responders. Now that's a, a question that's worth looking at. You can do something about that. You know, telling people don't be close to where a bomb's about to go off <laughs> isn't very helpful. So um, yeah, so that's module two. Module three, get to know your data. Uh, it's probably dirty. So this is a, intended to sort of extend the training that um, uh, epidemiologists have had um, in their doctoral programs, where typically the data sets that they use are extremely clean, very well documented, and pristine. They really don't need to question whether the raw data are correct or not. Um, that's not always true, but in, in applied epidemiology, it's, it is always true that it's, that, it's, that it's not true. It's always true that the data are dirty. We, so in this module, what we would do is we would have students um, think about collecting their own data. What are you going to need to collect to answer the question that you need to answer? And how will you collect it to make it easy for you to analyze it um, when you get to that point. And then we would also have them look at using existing data and thinking about what was the process by which these data were generated? What are the gaps, missingness, bias, systematic error that are likely to be introduced by that process of, of data collection? And we would also have them spend some time manipulating it, creating new variables, merging data sets, and, and so forth. Again, I think I could get Matt to come be a guest lecturer for this one. Next is choose appropriate methods. And um, I'll say in my world, simpler is often better. So I think that there is, um, I've heard, and I'm very intimidated by, uh, a lot of discussion about the, the new methods. And I think it's, I, I, what I'm going to say now, I'm not in any way um, disrespecting or devaluing the sophisticated methods that have been developed in the field over the last um, you know, 10 or 20 years. They're enormously valuable in the right place. But very often in my world, it's not the right place. So for us, simple descriptive analysis is often what we need to understand the, the problem. Um, and yet, I, I notice, and, and my informants have noticed, that um, people arriving at CDC often almost feel embarrassed to say that they're doing descriptive analysis, as if that's so unsophisticated that it's not, um, like, you just wouldn't even want to own it. So I think that um, I'd like to see descriptive analysis get some more love. Um, the other sort of side of this is um, that Often what we need is a fast and good, or not wrong, answer, but we don't necessarily need enormous precision. And I'll give you an example of this um, that's sort of one of my favorites, but it, it would apply to almost any outbreak. So you'll remember there was, a few years ago, there was an outbreak of fungal meningitis that was associated with contaminated steroids that people were having injected into their backs and knees for, for back pain. Well, you know, the true risk ratio in that situation, you know, for having, developing fungal meningitis and get, getting injected with this contaminated stuff, you know, was probably, I don't know, over 1,000, over 10,000? I mean, you know, inc incredibly high association between that exposure and that outcome. It doesn't matter to us what, that, what the magnitude of that association is. What matters to us is that we identify the vehicle so it can be taken off the market. So we can tolerate a lot of bias in control selection, and we can accept really flawed controls because they're very unlikely to keep us from identifying the vehicle. Um, so that's, I, guess, I think, another example of when the methods need to match the, the problem, the question uh, that needs to be answered, and part of that question is the time urgency around it. Our next module will be about making a decision. Uh, um, one of my informants called this time-sensitive decision-oriented reasoning. So what happens in, certainly in an outbreak, but you know, in many other sort of applied public health situations, is that information comes in a little bit at a time. And at each step of the way, every day, sometimes every hour, you have to decide 
do I know enough now to communicate something to the public, to, take, to recommend that this product come off the market, to make a recommendation that physicians do something or don't do something? When do you know enough? What we would talk about in this module would be how to, how to think about uncertainty. When should you be uncertain? How do you think about the pros and the cons of making a decision under uncertainty? How much uncertainty do you, can you tolerate depending on the consequences of the decision? Next, communication. And um, I'll get Alan as the um, guest lecturer for this one. Uh, don't be such a scientist. So um, when our, um, our new EIS officers join us, they are usually, if they've had epidoctoral training, they are usually very, very good at talking to other epidemiologists. Um, and, and, and that's great. They need to be. I mean, they need to be able to um, explain their work to their peers and, um, you know, uh, be credible in professional settings. Um, but they also, to be effective in applied public health, um, need to be able to communicate to many other groups. So the way that, they're, that you communicate, we communicate to each other, is very different than um, if we're talking to the press, to directly to uh, families, patients, to physicians, um, to congressional staffers who are going to determine our funding. Each of those groups has, needs a different ball, and you might throw it to them in a different way. And so you have to be able, not, not everyone has to be really good at this, but everyone needs to be able to think about it and at least to help the people who will be doing the speaking to have the right messages so that they can um, communicate in a way that, the, that, that actually communicates, that the person on the receiving end can, can understand and can work with. So I have an example of this. This is a, um, a set of papers that I'm not an author on, but I was heavily involved with, it, uh, published in 2011. Um, on um, foodborne illness um, acquired in the United States, um, published in Emerging Infectious Diseases, um, a huge impact, it's been cited, um, I think, um, you know, thousands of times. Um, it gives specific estimates for um, domestically acquired and travel associated and foodborne illness acquired, uh, attributable to 31 specific agents and also to unspecified agents had to be published as two papers, four web appendices, a total of 108 pages of uh, technical material to ex fully explain the methods and give the results. Um, and it's been really, really useful. Um, all kinds of um, groups from, you know, from the food industry to consumer advocates to epidemiologists have, have used this information. But a big part of the effort was also to prepare it for communication to other audiences. So the amount of work that it takes to be able to get from what I showed you on the previous slide to this CNN um, uh, visual that is, that is correct and much, much simpler is, is, it's a lot. It's a lot of work and involved a team of people. Now, now it also involved not just the epidemiologists but the professional communicators, but you have to build in the, the, the time, the awareness of the impact of this, and the ability to um, the ability to see the value of it. So finally, um, this course will end up with uh, a capstone, which will be an outbreak investigation, and this will be a based on a real situation uh, with the real urgency that um, we experienced during an outbreak the um, quality that I mentioned earlier of staged revelation of information. Um, the students are going to have to think about what it is they need to know and how they're going to gather that information. Um, they're going to need to think about missing data, dirty data. They're going to need to think about merging data sets. At every step along the way, they're going to need to think about risk communication. What can they say now? Um, to the public, to professional colleagues, to the press. 
And then they will need to decide at what point they're ready, they're certain enough about um, the source of the outbreak to take action to end it. So um, this is my last slide. I have just a few kind of uh, last thoughts on training the applied epidemiologists of the future. Um, so there's, certainly there's a lot of things that are changing. Um, ever larger data sets, the new analytic methods to deal with them. Also, the evolving communications um, uh, technology and techniques. Um, I don't know whether it's true that, um, that robots will never be able to do epi thinking, but they're certainly going to get better at it than they are now. Um, but I do think that the more things change, the more they stay the same, in the sense that the value of the epidemiologic approach to thinking about appropriate methods to analyze data to answer a question that matters is, is still going to be primary. I don't think that robots are going to get there very quickly. Um, the work is going to continue to be multidisciplinary, and epidemiologists will continue to be able to have a, um, their greatest impact when they're able to work across all the disciplines that are involved. And then the need for an action-oriented approach to problems. So thank you. This is CDC from the back. Thank you very much. So uh, now we're going to actually go to having a panel, um, and so we'll hopefully discussion. So I'm going to ask all the speakers to come up to the table. Um, and apparently we have our first question already, and I don't have to do a filler question. Sweet. <laughs> Let everyone sit down. <laughs> okay. Hello, great talks, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so in several of these talks where we're saying sort of all of these new developments in EPI and how do we balance um, sort of not losing the basics and how to ask a good question and how to think like a scientist. And I'm wondering, sort of, if you think about the graduate program, two to four, five years, if we just keep learning more and more and more, that gets denser unless we start teaching it earlier. And are we doing enough as epidemiologists or even just scientists to teach this in undergraduate or in high school? There's no AP epidemiology class, but I mean, you look at mathematics, calculus was the height of math and now it's taught in high school. So how, what could we be doing to teach some of these fundamentals so we can focus on the more advanced methods because people come in already knowing the fundamentals we're, we're having to teach? I have some thoughts on this. Um, so as somebody who has uh, a daughter in high school, I, I have witnessed the number of things that kids in uh, their high school curriculum have already had to cram in compared to the things that we had when I was in high school. Uh, and so I'm not totally convinced that we, we necessarily are going to be able to go that route of getting it earlier and earlier. So much as I actually think we need to go in an opposite direction, I think we need to focus our energy on training people how to learn these methods themselves. I think we need to focus on what we think are the fundamentals and then train people really how to learn how to, to get what they need when they need it. Um, I think to me that's the only sustainable way. So I'm just going to piggyback on that because I was going to answer the question in an incredibly similar way. Um, I think that graduate training is really about teaching people how to think. So, um, you know, Alan talked about creativity and can it be taught, and all you have to do is listen to a couple of TED Talks I've done and go to the free online course on the edX platform, and actually we have data that proves that we can increase people's creative thinking by two to three fold over the period of a semester over curriculum. 
So um, I think it's really about, again, teaching people approaches, how to think, how to ask the right question, how to be creative, how to be rigorous, et cetera. And then the skills, the specific skills, you know, don't be in the woods and get lost for the trees. Um, those really are things that we can teach people how to pick up without spending all of our time in the curriculum doing that. So I agree. So I think I have the same answer from a different point of view. Um, I, I talked, when I was talking with these dozen or so colleagues at CDC about, well, how would you fit this in, right? It's not like, um, it's not like doctoral students are, are, you know, sort of sitting around, you know, eating bonbons in the evening. Um, and and what, the, what, what they said, uh, and what makes sense to me, is that um, they said they would have been fine with having one less advanced methods course and um, more sort of surveillance, the sort of applied epi um, content that, that I was talking about. And uh, obviously that's not for people who think they want to go and you know, be, become methodologists. It's for the people who think they want to go into applied public health. <clears throat> But um, the, the observation was that um, people felt like if you have learned an advanced method, then you've learned how to learn advanced methods and that you could then learn what you need when you get out um, sort of into the, into the field, so to speak. And um, to, so that's sort of like learning how to learn, learning how to think um, could be more of a focus. So, all right, so um, I, I guess some of what I'm say is on the whole, the whole week and some, or whole two days and some is a statement. So I don't know if I have enough gray hair yet to do this, but I'm going to anyway. And Dr. Mahan took some of what I say, but you know, as a lot of the conversation that's been happening over the past two days, as an infectious disease epidemiologist who focuses on acute infectious diseases, I feel kind of left out. Like, the, uh, nobody asks us why we're epidemiologists or is epidemiologist any, worth anything. I get more often get asked, am I a real epidemiologist? Because I'm not, like, in the field investigating an outbreak. So it's clear that there is a use for epidemiology. And then the other thing, and I think this is more uh, fundamental, is that the questions we're asking are different, and I wonder if it, more broadly we need to be thinking more broad in terms of the questions we ask. So I feel like most of the conversation or a lot of the conversation has been around why, but you know, there's like, if we take the old um, right, uh, journalism you know, set of who, what, when, where, why, and how, and I'd also say what now. Um, and all of those are incredibly important questions, I think, around the broader epidemiological questions that we, um, you know, that, and in a field, like in, in acute infectious disease, for measles, for instance, we know why. There is no question, and we know why, and we know what stops it, and we know exactly what to do, and I still have more work than I could ever do in my entire life in measles and measles epidemiology until maybe we eradicate it. So I think having a broader perspective on the types of questions we ask. And then I think there's also a thing on how we specify our questions and the hypothesis and the precision. Like I see, I see this question about can it be put in an RCT as a little bit of a subset of a larger question, of a larger issue? And the issue is we can need to be able to, per, um, to place our hypotheses in precise falsifiable formats. And saying, imagining the RCT is one way to do that, and it has, does have relationships to you know, actually modifying behavior. But there are other ways to do that. There are other ways to write precise, precise falsifiable models, you know, that are deeper than some of what we do. And, and we do a lot of that in infectious diseases. So I guess the, the comment is, is that, you know, so some of it's a little bit like, don't forget about us, we're epidemiologists too, was part of the conversation. And some of it is, I think there is 
a different, you know, as the field matures, what's happened in infectious diseases is reflective of as the field matures, the way types of questions we may be asking are going to change. And the, you know, this period of asking why being the central tenant of epidemiology is merely a step on a journey and there are still going to be incredibly important questions to ask and incredibly important work to do. So people can or cannot comment on that. I realize it's not a question. <laughs> now, throughout our discussion, whether it was in the breakout sessions or in your presentations, we talked about basically epidemiologists as a scientist, except for your last presentation, Dr. Mann, which came from a perspective of epidemiologists as a professional. Training a professional or teaching a professional needs two things. One, a broad paradigm that you try to develop through your course model of what does the paradigm of developing an epidemiologist require? And within that paradigm, what are the specific competencies? I still hear that people are talking about skills. Competencies is what we need to train people. That's what we need to have people to go through. Competencies are specific job this job description items that people, when they go out, they should be able to do. That's what, I haven't heard that, the word competency throughout this discussion of training in epidemiology. And the first effort that we did in, in developing competencies in epidemiology goes back to about 30 years. We started at this school. Now, one more thing which also takes me back to uh, what was said about communication. Uh, and that Dr. Wilcox, um, you mentioned about the two, the yin and yang. Um, we were transmitted, I think it was through Dr. Comstock, something that Wade Anton Frost used to tell his students when they wrote a scientific paper. They said, he, he said apparently, read that paper again. If you find a sentence in that paper that is really beautiful prose, Delete it, <laughs> because that's not scientific writing. And Alan, you just negated that, and good for you. <laughs> Any comments? All right. <clears throat> Thank you for, uh, my name is Sanjay Bae, and I'm a fourth year PhD student in this department. And thank you very much for very uh, interesting discussion so far. I really enjoyed it. So um, there are two things I'm crazy about. So the first is advanced methods, like machine learning, Bayesian method. I, I do my, I wash my dishes using Bayesian methods. <laughs> and I strongly believe that uh, epidemiol well, um, the students in epidemiology will greatly benefit from increased exposure to those novel methods. And I, the second thing I'm crazy about is soccer. And in soccer, there's a famous uh, quote that uh, form is temporary, but class is permanent. And I think it, uh, it translates nicely into epi language as uh, methods are temporary, but reasoning is permanent. So I really uh, agree with that the biggest thing that graduate students should learn is learning, actually learning how to learn. And realizing that was like, I would say, highlight of my PhD training. So combining these two, my, my question is, um, do you believe a, an, 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 um, most of this, well, I would say, 
a typical student who goes through a typical epidemiologic training in either a master's level or doctoral level uh, are equipped with sufficient quantitative literacy to study advanced methods such as machine learning on their own. No. Um, I, 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 I mean, obviously, I don't want to speak for uh, all programs, but I would certainly say that I think at the, the master's level, probably not, but I do think that we could put more emphasis on that. And I do think that we, in programs that are doing really well, are thinking a lot about how to train people to be self-learners. But I, but I don't think it probably at the end of a master's program, you're really going to necessarily be able to do that. But you know, what a good master's program should do is should, should set you on the pathway to your first job where you get mentorship and you'd have opportunities to be able to learn from people who could, you know, do some supervised training for you. But I think really it's probably the doctoral level at which we are really going to be set people on that course to being able to be self-learners and things that are quite complex. So yeah, uh, The other thing I would add to that is I think it, it comes to the point that Alan made about making friends, you know, like for my students, we don't teach a class in the epi department on machine learning, but I had a student who really wanted to use it for a particular research question, and I said, oh, hey, I have a whole bunch of friends who can help you with that. And, you know, you just kind of get people connected, you build your network, and he's been able to do his dissertation teaching me tons of new things, because you have a network of people who are smarter than you, and you connect your smart people with their smart people, and. You know, I think that's part of how it happens as well. At, but I agree that the method itself is ephemeral. You know, like it's going to be developed in another year. They'll be like, oh my God, can you believe this rudimentary thing that we did in this dissertation? It was like we were babies. You know, but really uh, thinking through a really good question is the thing that most students struggle with much more than mastering Bayesian methods. So I think your, your, your question was whether a master's degree student would be able to do a, a, an analysis by himself or herself? So um, my question is whether either master's or doctoral program um, uh, equips a student with enough quantitative skills to um, let them study advanced methods themselves? Or, or I would say literacy would be a better, or fitness would be a better word than just skills. So maybe I'm just admitting my own inadequacy, but I don't think I'm in a position to do an analysis yeah. by myself. <laughs> I really depend on my colleagues to help me understand my blind spots. And so I wouldn't encourage anyone. In fact, when I was an editor and I got a single author paper, I was very suspicious. And they were usually terrible. They were usually on the crackpot side because they didn't have that balance of, of criticism that we need to really focus our, our abilities. So I will just want to weigh in just a little bit on this. So at, you know, I think one of the opportunities is for the students in the room that are doing their doctoral you know, work and everything like that, is you do have the opportunities to seek out in terms of other coursework and lay that foundation, right? For those of you who are willing to go through and do that Master of uh, Health Science and Biostatistics, you can actually at least get the foundation such that if you are going to go to do more advanced methods in terms of needing to be able to learn and actually go to the statistical literature and understand the equations and things like that, you do have that opportunity. But at the end of the day, it comes down to that opportunity cost. Because when you're pursuing that MHS, what are you giving up in the other time that you could be doing to advance your progress to get through your doctoral program? I just want to actually say one more thing, which is I think there's a, there's a big role, too, for professional societies. I mean, I'm just looking at our current and next president of the Society for Epidemiological Research in the, in the room. And you know, at, for example, SER, we, every year we have tons of different workshops that specifically teach concrete methods. And so again, it's like if you need a skill, that's much more doable, I think, as a, as a discrete entity than a way of thinking, which is what a doctoral program should be teaching you. Thank you. Uh, on this side now, <laughs> Joe Korish. For, so first of all, thank you for a wonderful session. I really enjoyed this session. I was sort of stimulated by it. 
A um, couple of quick questions. One is uh, to Professor Keyes, maybe, but other people could comment. In the lumping versus splitting category, uh, what do you think are the pros versus cons of seeing population sciences as its own discipline versus sitting within epidemiology among many jewels in the crown? Um, I, you know, I do think it depends somewhat on how you define each discipline. You know, the way I think about it and the way I try to lay it out, they seem pretty different where, you know, to be a population health scientist, the set of foundational principles that you're guided under are quite different than the principles of epidemiology, which are a little more problem focused and applied. Um, population health sciences I see as a little more theoretical and um, based on just on a different set of principles. And so to me, separating them out is very, was very clarifying to me of where I wanted to build my career. Um, but for other people, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people in epidemiology who have their hat in multiple disciplines. You know, having different disciplines doesn't mean that you have to pick one. Um, but it's just kind of a different set of principles, I think, for me. Yeah, others, because to me often, I think, right, in some sense, we're a maturing field, uh, maybe not so mature given the nature of the questions that were being asked. I'd like us to sort of, I'd like to think that over time we'd get more powerful in having a voice as an entity. I think there are only so many entities the public can register. And many of us, at least I have over a few decades, done things that are pretty different from each other, right? So in some sense I view this as simulation with a certain perspective. And sometimes we've done different things, you know, the blood pressure things by rows, population versus individuals very much took that. So I see that as very much fitting within the paradigm. And it's, I'm not sure, any more different than it was molecular epidemiology and then genetic epidemiology and then GWAS and now proteomics and now individualized and not individualized. And my preference has been to say we should do good science and then somehow bring everything under the tent. But I've obviously got a bias. You're a lumper. Uh, I'm a lumper in the service of an answer. <laughs> Other people are, but then I have another quick question. Failed to provoke. So, so I, I have a, um, an observation, um, which is it was really interesting talking with people who had gone to multiple different schools to find out how different, radically different their, um, their courses of, of study had been. And um, I, I think there's a lot of variation, a lot of variability uh, from school to school. Now, I'm, I'm a physician, you know, medical schools, I think, you know, they may approach it in different ways, but they're pretty much covering a lot of the same stuff. I think um, epidemiology programs are way more diverse. The other thing that, just on that topic that I will say about sort of population health science is one, one of the impetuses for writing the book was that so many universities were creating population health science degrees. And if you looked at their kind of foundational statements of what they were trying to do with those degrees, it was wildly different. And so it was like, okay, we, you know, it, it's not only that we were wanting to create a new field or anything like that, it was like, this is being done and no one has set out what the core principles are. And so let's take a stab at it. You know, if, if it's, no one's done it before, we just get to make it up and then people can tell us we're wrong, but at least then we have a conversation going. And so one of the reasons why we did the book was to say, here's what we think population health science is and how it's distinct from other disciplines. Maybe we should use this as a starting ground for the, all of these programs that are being developed. I mean, that's neat. And sort of developing an area, communicating it clearly is I think incredibly valuable. You can tell I'm making the argument that the tent should be big. Yeah. Um, I, I think that may relate to a quick question for uh, Professor Ness. Uh, Innovative, uh, interesting, none of us showed up naked today, so <laughs> maybe that's good. Uh, I, I'm struck that often, for me, uh, innovation is driven, dramatic innovation is driven by technology and being able to do things we've never been able to do before, right? We needed the microscope, and without that, you know, in microbiology, it would have been hard to do what people did in, in infectious disease. You know, you mentioned PCR, CRISPR, et cetera. In some sense, how does that relate to epidemiology and embracing new technologies and defining back to that broader tent where 
we just better welcome these things because if we say that it's too technical, it's not epidemiology, then it's going to be hard to move forward. Yeah. Well, two things I would say. Number one, um, tech, new technologies are necessary but not sufficient, clearly, right? So they're necessary for sure. I mean, uh, when I lecture, I actually literally talk about HPV and PCR and how you know, we couldn't figure out that it was HPV until we had PCR, right? We knew it was a sexually transmitted disease and know what it was. Um, so necessary but not sufficient. And, you know, of course, the other piece, and I talk a lot about what Alan talked about, the dialectic, the yin and yang of creativity and technology or, you know, kind of the two parts of the brain. Um, the other uh, point that I would make is that um, epidemiology um, needs to find its technology. You know, uh, that is to say, um, we know uh, why surgeons um, are so valued because they invent procedures uh, that improve uh, health and uh, save people's lives. And I think what's really requisite for epidemiology at this point is to think revolutionarily about its contributions to process. Um, I don't know what that means, actually, because if I did, I get the Nobel Prize in epidemiology. <laughs> um, but, um, but I do know, or I think I know, that that's one of the major pieces to the puzzle. I, you know, personally, I think that we are at a transformative point in that when people talk about big data, the individualized data, I think, can explode and will continue to explode where soon we will have continuous data or very frequent data at all settings on all people. And so I think our challenge will be data reduction into something meaningful. Absolutely. You know, so in some sense, I think we're going to get incredible bounties if we stay at the right place of data, and then we'll have to make questions and answers out of those. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with it. Barbara. I very often say the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. With the stupid part, I will say thank you to everybody. I didn't know November 9th was epidemiology's <laughs> birthday, and thank you for wishing me a happy birthday from everybody. <laughs> okay, my name is Chinaya Ogoji. I'm a second year doctoral student in the department, and I want to thank you for a very interesting discussion so far. I have a comment and then a question. Um, coming from an implementation science background, I really find this discussion very interesting. Um, while I, you know, I, I, I don't quite agree that the, we should cut down on the methods because I've found them very, very useful. And I think that the methods are very useful too for those who are in implementation science, those, are in, who, those who are in CDC. Because beyond finding this, beyond surveillance and finding where the disease is, at some point you want to understand how best to curtail the spread of that disease. And that's where the methods come in. And that's where you know, people like Dr. Lesla come in, understanding the spread of the disease and how to actually curtail, um, finding the best mechanisms to curtail the spread of the disease. So I think it's not either or. I think both, both should you know, kind of overlap and augment each other. Um, however, I think that in this school, this school has a lot of resources in terms of the methods, in terms of surveillance, in terms of implementation science. But I think the real issue is that many doctoral students come in here not knowing exactly where they're going. So we come in here and then we just go with the flow. We go with what's available. You find out that everyone is doing, working on one disease or the other, and then you focus on the disease, thinking that that's what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. And then you graduate and then you're faced with opportunities at CDC, which you didn't really plan to do at the beginning. And then you find yourself at CDC, and then you think that your training is deficient. So I think that it's the responsibility of the school to make courses available. And it's the responsibility of the student to search out those courses and take them while you're, while you're in the school. Make your training as broad as you can so that you're prepared for whatever career 
you're faced with in the future. But now my question is, um, how do we make students comfortable when they come in to focus on, you know, if a student decides that, oh, I want to head to CDC right after graduation, how do you think that the EPI curriculum can actually help those students be comfortable? And, you know, help them forget about all the methods and just focus on a particular area that prepares them for a career at CDC. Because right now I think that the fear is, Oh, how, how can I come to Hopkins and not just take all these advanced, beautiful, advanced methods classes? How do we make students who, you know, who really want to focus on those kind of simple things that you describe, you know, how do we make them comfortable when they come in for the PhD program? And that's my question. But in terms of those classes being available, I know that every single thing on your list, every single topic you mentioned on your list is available in the school. There are classes on surveillance, beautiful classes on surveillance. There are classes on economic evaluations. There are classes on data management and all that. But students don't know where they are heading. And so they tend to just go with the flow. And then heading to CDC, it's a big shock that all of the advanced methods we learned are not very useful at CDC. So my question is, how do we make students you know, come in for a PhD in epidemiology and know exactly that I can be called an epidemiologist and I can be recognized as a good epidemiologist without having to take these advanced classes and just take, you know, head to CDC and be a descriptive epidemiologist. <laughs> That's my question. Thank you. So could I, I just need to, I have obviously um, made a terrible mistake because I don't want you to not learn uh, methods. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Referring to the recommendation by your students, I mean by your staff, who said they think, they think we should cut down on one or two advanced methods courses. They would say and if, if they needed, to, if, if for the student who knows they want to come to CDC, how would you fit that in? What they would say would be take one less advanced methods course to fit in my course. Okay, so, I, you know, but I, I guess um, I'll turn it over to, to my colleagues to, to talk about how do you. Um, how do you help the student do that? But I, I would think it would be through academic advising and possibly career tracks. Um, and I think a lot of schools do have advice um, along those lines. I'm, I'm not sure what, what, how Hopkins approaches that. I, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I did want to comment on uh, your comment about uh, methods are important and we, we don't want to stop learning and studying and developing new methods, and I'm totally in agreement. My point is not to say that we should not be studying methods. My point is we should be integrating into methods courses opportunities to teach people how to think clearly about the questions you could ask with those methods. So we're getting close on time, so how about we do one last question, and I think Dr. Martha Werler is the last one. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Martha Worler from Boston University, and so my um, question is um, on a, a different theme, which um, has to do with the possibility that um, in future years that epidemiology as a standalone um, well department, I'm a chair of a, a department of epidemiology, so um, I very much identify with epidemiology, but within the scope of public health, there are some movements to sort of get rid of these silos within the discipline of public health, um, and that epidemiology and biostatistics are really tools that are used at the service of public health science. And um, so I'm, I, I guess I'll just toss that out there. Does anybody have any experience with this? We were just recently um, reviewed by the CEF um, folks and you not, not overtly stated, but I kind of have the feeling that that's maybe the direction that they would prefer. Does anyone have any experience with this? Or am I just paranoid? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I don't think you're paranoid. I can say that because when I was giving my talk and I was thinking about you know, getting to a certain age where I started thinking about my own personal bucket list, I also started thinking, does epidemiology need a bucket list? Because maybe we are actually getting to the point where 100 years from now, 
maybe we aren't actually uh, just a department of epidemiology. I'm not sure that I look forward to that or think that's the right way to go, but I don't think you're alone in thinking that we may be pushed in that direction um, because the, 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 the skills that we need to be able to answer the kinds of questions that we want to answer will require epi methods, but they'll also require data science and they'll require computer programming and they'll require artificial intelligence and so many other things that, you know, epidemiology may still exist, but it may be part of uh, a much more comprehensive program in, in, you know, how to answer questions. So, okay, so I think we should wrap up in the interest of time and so some of our uh, guests can make their flight. Um, but, you know, some of the themes I think for essentially this whole symposium was to think about who we are as a field and where we're gonna be going over the next 100 years and, the, and whether or not, you know, we are gonna be stay relevant. And really, it's about essentially, we've heard from this session about asking questions perhaps using the simplest approaches to answer those questions. We don't necessarily have to go to the most complex methods. It's what can we do to actually address the question in the right way. Um, but you know, the question out there is still, what do we bring to that multidisciplinary table, right? And so the question is, and then just as Matt was saying, in terms of maybe we're gonna have data science and everybody else and this person and that person in there. Where are we going to fit in there? Because we do bring a certain skill set, I think, at the end of the day. So, thank you, everybody, for being with us.